Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Really appreciate it. I'm really excited to be here. Um, just have learned some amazing things from the speakers today. And from the looks of tomorrow's schedule, it's going to be even better. So I'm really excited about that. I was hoping you guys might um, join me for a moment just with thanking Terrell for having the vision, for putting on an event like this, as well as Quail Spring Springs Baptist Church for hosting us, and uh, Mark Bernardo for producing just another event. I mean, this is... There really, really just is not another venue like this that's focused specifically on ministry communications. And the fact that you guys have taken time out of your insanely busy schedules, because Sunday seems to keep coming with amazing regularity, right? And so to be able to take time out to do something like this is a big deal. So thanks so much for doing that. Um, as Jeff had mentioned, I've kind of been on all sides of the table as it relates to communications. Uh, I was on staff at Willow Creek Community Church leading their visual communications team. I was a volunteer graphic designer. I've been a freelancer and currently I lead a communications firm, Aspire One. And in that role, it's kind of exciting to get to work with some pretty influential churches all over the country, uh, some being Granger Community Church, Willow, we still kind of keep connections that way, Seacoast, as well as a host of others that name, some with names that you may not recognize but are doing some really, really creative things. And part of my job is to stay on top of what's happening, not only in the ministry world but in the marketplace as well, to be paying attention to trends that are coming up and how people are communicating. And the crazy thing is that, you know, like it or not, we are in the midst of a revolution. You can call it a revolution of information, communication, technology, whatever. The way that we engage with people is changing. What used to work maybe five, ten, or even just a couple of years ago may not be as effective as it once was. Um, case in point, this is the part where the slide goes, okay. You guys may have heard about this church that posted this message on their outdoor sign recently in response to the pop hit, I Kissed a Girl by Katy Perry. I'm sure their intentions were good. When interviewed by the local paper, the senior pastor said that it was intended to be a loving reminder, warning teens, that the scriptures are not ambiguous on these issues. Can you feel the love, you know, that's kind of coming through there? I mean, I, I just, I, I thought about it, I'm like, okay, let me see if I've got this straight. If the goal was to remind young teens that the Bible is not pro-homosexuality, would this be the most effective way to accomplish that goal? Or is there a higher likelihood that people might misinterpret, be unfamiliar with the song, you know, wonder, since when is the church against guys kissing girls, you know? Or, you know, and, and just assume that the church is condemning, judgmental, and out of touch like never before. And then we wonder why we hear things like the clip I'm going to show you in just a second when people outside the church are asked what they think about Christians. Uh, you guys can go ahead and roll that. Out of touch? Uh, hopeful. Yeah. On their part. They're hoping for something they're not going to uh, get, I believe. Um, psycho. Uneducated. Backward. The South. I think of somebody that's possibly just a little bit, um, a little bit overboard, a little bit extreme. My uncle Bob, um, conservative, white, fanatical, oh. Bible thumpers, crazy. <laughs> People who wear white and like kind of glow, but are kind of freaky. Okay. Yeah, and um, Texas. I think I think there's a lot of stick stigmas attached to that word. I can't answer that. <laughs> Crazy. Okay. Frightening. Yeah. Yeah. I just overpowering. Overpowering. Yeah. You don't want to know. Somewhat scary. Um, maybe a little rigid in their full in their dogma and their philosophy. Oh, um, nothing too good. That's pretty sad, isn't it? And that was actually an interview that Scott Hodge did for his church, The Orchard, 
for a series where they asked people on the streets of Chicago, just random people, what their perceptions are of Christians and then what their perceptions are of Jesus. Now, thankfully, you know, Jesus got a much better rap than the, those that are following him, but, you know, the intention is still there, and so, or the intent was still there. It's, it's scary. You know, we have a lot of baggage that we need to overcome, a lot of preconceived notions of what church is all about. And when churches are doing things that are kind of working against us, it, it certainly isn't helping. We as communicators play a really powerful role in this equation. We have the most important message on the planet, the only one that truly can save lives when we think about it. And it's our job to help people outside the church to connect the dots so they can get to know Jesus and understand what the church has to offer. We can influence or control the voice of our church to those around us. But unfortunately, the world is getting a little crazy, and it's getting harder and harder for our voice to be heard. I mean, people's lives are busy, they're stressed, they're overscheduled with lots of stuff. Life stuff, work stuff, marriage stuff, stuff stuff. You know, um, oftentimes we're not even on their radar screen. Now, the fundamental beliefs of Christianity haven't changed. Our message at the core hasn't changed. But the way we engage people, it demands change. If we're going to have any chance of reaching people who are far from God, we need to start switching tactics. First Chris. First Corinthians in chapter 12:32 in the Bible it says that the men of Issachar understood the times that they live in and they knew what Israel should do. Can we say the same thing? We need to understand today's culture and start leveraging it versus having it work to our detriment. People really they want to engage. They want to be part of the conversation. They want to play. I mean, with us. Why else would all these social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and MySpace be so wildly popular? Because it's about community. People are able to share stories with each other and, and engage. They can get in the game. Well, this applies to our, our efforts in marketing as well. Marketing is no longer a one-way conversation. It used to be that we would come up with this brilliant message, and we'd print it on a promotional postcard, and then we'd mail it out to absolutely everybody and their grandmother with the hope that maybe 1% or 2% might respond. 1% to 2%. I mean, seriously? Since, since when is failing 99% of the time acceptable in anything else that we do? The question is no longer, how can we get people <laughs> this slide's a little bit slow. How can we get people to our service, our outreach event, or our homepage? Instead, we need to be asking, how do we want to change the relationship that we have with this person today? So I thought the best way to kind of drive this point home would be through today's talk. Instead of me standing up here and kind of lecturing about best practices, do's and don'ts, and blah, 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 blah. You know, we want, I want this to be experiential. I want to change the relationship that you and I have today. I also want to help change the relationship that you guys have with your audiences moving forward. So, what we're going to do, you guys ready? I want everybody to stand up. Yes. These slides are very slow. They're not working. See, this would be the... Yes, really. Okay. When they are delayed that much, they just don't have the impact. So you guys have to work with me here. I know it's post-lunch and it's kind of nap time, so I appreciate you guys humoring. Okay, what I want you to do is, everybody, I want you to touch your, touch your nose. Start by touching your nose. Thank you. I'm going to start rubbing your belly. Okay. I'm going to start bouncing up and down. Okay. Stop. Now, did any of you guys resist wanting to do that? You can actually sit back down now. I mean, you were wondering kind of, all right, what's the point? Why is she having us do this? Has she seriously lost her mind? This just seems so absolutely ridiculous. Well, it felt totally wrong, I could imagine. Yes? Because it was, it was totally a waste of time. There was no purpose to it at all. And that's just the point. Engaging just for the sake of engagement 
isn't going to work. You need to have a point and a message behind the madness. It really doesn't matter, you know, um, just to have people do something, just to have them do it. Because if you, otherwise people are going to get frustrated, they're going to get annoyed, they're going to resent you for wasting their time. And so when we think about how we engage people, the whole point is, well, what's the message? This is just another channel for us to be able to deliver the message. You may have one chance, because the worst thing that can happen is that you're going to lose credibility. People aren't going to want to do it again. If I ask you guys to stand up and do that again, chances are I'm going to be sitting here bouncing, looking silly solo, you know, because we've already tried that once. It's like, well, that's not going to work. So if you don't know what your message is, you know, it doesn't matter how slick the channel is or how you try to engage people if you don't have a purpose behind it. Big businesses are just as susceptible to falling into this trap. Um, has anyone seen the lovely IBM commercials with Seinfeld and Bill Gates? Raise a hand, show of hands, any of you guys see that? What were they thinking? I mean, quite honestly, I don't know if you guys heard, but there was uh, Twitter's out today that they actually pulled that campaign. Like $300 million was the ad budget rumored to be for that. And because the commercials were tanking so bad, they just, they just pulled them. I mean, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but for me, it seems like maybe they were so concerned with trying to do something cool and edgy and different from the wildly successful Mac ads that they just totally lost sight of their core message and their focus and their purpose. And so, you know, I had no idea if they were trying to sell shoes, the shoe store, you know, and I don't ever ever want to see Bill Gates shake his moneymaker on national TV again, ever. I mean, seriously, ever. I want to give you guys an, uh, an example of engagement that does work, though. Uh, I want to tell you about a company called Blendtec. Now, I don't know if any of you guys heard of this Blendtec. Okay. Blendtec is a company that makes high-quality blenders that blend literally just about anything. And so um, their home models, they actually start at $400 for their home model of a blender. Now, the problem is there's lots of companies that make blenders. In the mind of consumers, you know, a blender's a blender, right? So why on earth would we want to spend $400 on one when we can just go to Target and pick one up for, you know, $15 or whatever? So obviously these guys needed to not only differentiate to try to prove why it was worth spending four hundred dollars on a blender and they had to find raving fans that were willing to help get the message out so that people knew what it was that they did and to demonstrate why you know it was different and why they should have these kinds of blenders so how did they do it well what they did is they created these very <laughs> low budget videos that were viral and people could send them to their friends. But the reason why people would want to send them to their friends is because they would blend insane things. Now I'm not talking like anchovy and banana smoothie insane things, but things that were insane like they should never be thought of blending, ever. And so um, I think maybe the best way to show you guys how this works is I'm going to show you one of their more recent viral videos that they sent out. Oh, and for all of our Mac lovers in the audience, if you have queasy stomachs, you might want to brace yourself, okay? We can uh, roll the clip. Will it blend? That is the question. And here we are in front of the AT&T store. And I'm here to keep up with the latest technology. I'm here to pick up my iPhone 3G. And I'm not the only one. Yeah! Hey, can I see your iPhone? You know you're going to blend it. Not me. Ah, this is great. I can't wait to get back to the office and try out my new phone. Got my new iPhone. So I'm not going to need the old one anymore. So I'm going to blend it. The new one is so cool. It's so much faster. It's going to keep me more organized. With all this technology, I won't forget anything. Now I'm going to blend my old phone. I think I'm going to press the smoothie button. Oh boy, 
iPhone smoke. Don't breathe this. Wait a minute. This isn't I smoke. This must be 3G smoke. I blended the wrong phone. Oh well, maybe I can put this on eBay. Can I see your new iPhone? <laughs> now, clearly they did not invest the $400 per blender budget into their marketing at all. <laughs> but uh, it just goes to show you, you don't need to have a big, huge marketing budget for things to be successful, because clearly the $300 million on the Seinfeld ads didn't quite work. But these you know, are, are wildly successful, go figure. I can't believe that they actually blended an iPhone. Did you know that they, they did auction the dust of that phone off on eBay for $400 someone actually bought? Now that is a loyal Apple fan. Just give me the dust. Yes, I'll keep it. You know, put it in a little urn, you know, or something like that. I don't know, crazy. But um, the thing about why these videos were so successful is because they were they were unusual. They were insane. People couldn't believe that they would blend stuff like this, and it demonstrated the superiority of their blenders. I mean, some of the other stuff that they would blend were equally as insane, like an iPod, a Wii controller. They actually had a video camera that they would have running, so you can see the blending capabilities from the inside of the blender, which was just silly. They put glow sticks in there, which was just disgusting. It looked like the lightning bugs when they get on your windshield and they smear. It was just really wrong. You know, in, a, in addition to marbles, they threw like a whole bag of marbles in there. So just a lot of funky stuff. To test them, they actually take two by fours for their commercial blenders, and then they just kind of, you know, jam those into their commercial blenders to make sure they work. It's like, what are you people eating? You know, that you need a two by four to be blendable. You know, I, I don't know, but it's kind of crazy. So if it can do that, I'm sure it can do lettuce or spinach or whatever else they might be blending. So. Uh, Mentos and Coke are two more examples of companies that can look at the very same challenge and respond in two different ways. Um, do you guys remember a lot of the uh, hoopla that was happening recently on YouTube when you take Coke or Diet Coke actually and Mentos and you combine the two, they explode, you know, all over the place? Well, Coke's response was to try to shut it down initially. They, you know, said, well, the product was not intended to be used that way, and they were trying to, you know, ignore it and just pretend it wasn't happening, and, you know, they refused to engage. Mentos, on the other hand, they ran with it. They even encouraged consumers to create their own videos of exploding types of things using Mentos and Diet Cola, of course, because, you know, Coke wasn't participating. Now, which company do you think changed the relationship it had with its customers? Well, the answer actually is both. Both of them changed the relationship, but which one changed the relationship for the better? Right? Well, Mentos. They were the ones that whose products, you know, their, the sales went through the roof. Everybody was racing to Mentos to go purchase those and was so excited that they got to be part of the experiment. They got to be part of the story. Well, think about that with your own churches. Think about, could you imagine what it would be like if you could change the relationship with the people that you're wanting to reach? If people were moved beyond a sit and be served on Sunday sort of a mentality to one where they were engaged, one where they were feeling personally responsible for wanting to invite people to weekend services and get the word out, could you imagine the impact that that would have in your community? Here's a handful of organizations that you guys I'm sure are familiar with. And what they all have in common is, is that for each one, it's not just about the product or service that they're offering, but people are actually contributing to the experience. Not only the relationship between the company and their audience has changed, but they've changed the landscape for their competitors as well and has raised the bar as a result. The new iPhone, they allow public developers to create applications and submit those, which essentially they have expanded their R&D team by an infinite number because everyone can now be part of that. YouTube, Flickr, and um, Twitter, you know, all are dependent on people sharing stories with each other and with the world. Amazon enables users to rank and review books 
for other potential readers. And then the one-click concept is just phenomenal. I mean, I, that's almost like an easy button that everybody would like to just have on their desk for everything in life. Like, oh, can we just make that a one-click for the bulletin this weekend? And it just appears. Wouldn't that be cool? <sighs> My favorite, though, has got to be Virgin Atlantic. Virgin Atlantic allows customers, their, their flyers, to help create the experience. It's no longer about the destination and just getting from point A to point B. Do you guys know that you can actually choose gifts to be delivered to a companion seat during the flight? You can create your own menus, like even in coach, you can create what you can choose what you want to eat. When you're in first class, you can choose not only what you want to eat, but when you want to eat. There are no set meal times at all. Now, I'm probably going out on a limb here, but I would imagine that's probably dramatically different than the experience that we all shared, even just trying to get here. I mean, I guess we did get to choose some of the things with our travel flight experiences, like, you know, which buy-on-board box snack we wanted to have, or whether or not we wanted to pay for water on our flight, or if it was worth $25 to check a bag, or, you know, whether I wanted to sit on my luggage or wedged between two strangers when my flight was deli delayed again, you know, and again, and again. You know, we don't quite get to choose the experience as much as Virgin Atlantic, but we get some choices. So how does this really apply to ministries? Well, I want to tell you guys about this really creative church that's in the Midwest, but first, I want you to be able to get in the game. This is going to be a team effort. I want you to be able to think of some ideas, ways that you can engage the audience in your own church. Now, this can be ideas that you guys are just thinking about for how you can engage people. Maybe they are things that you're already doing, like uh, Ginger was talking about, or maybe they're things that you just heard about someone else is doing. But what we're going to do is we're going to have the definition of engage be a pretty broad bucket for this exercise. And the definition is truly going to be, you know, just basically any creative way that gets people involved instead of us as a church just talking at them. And then when I'm done sharing these examples, we're going to share your ideas as a group. So how this is going to work is you guys are actually going to text. You can pull out your handy-dandy little cell phones, and if you don't already have 47201 on speed dial, you probably want to program that because your thumbs will thank you later before we get to the end of the weekend. So text the word, the keyword ideas, and then type in what your idea is in the same message to 47201. And what we'll do is when I get done talking about some of these churches, we'll display them on the side screens and talk about them as a group. Does that sound good? Most people, most speakers don't encourage others to not pay attention to when they're speaking, but you guys will probably get more out of that than you will whatever it is that I have to say. So I think we'll be good. Okay. So Reynoldsburg United Methodist Church in Ohio wanted to illustrate the parable of talents to their congregation. So they gave them $67,000. They actually gave $67,000 to their congregation. They gave 50 bucks to each adult and $10 to each student. And they challenged the congregation to use their own talents to turn the money into something bigger. Well, the cool thing is that over $117,000 was turned in, which included all of the original startup money that they used to fund you know, the initial handing out of it. Plus, they had $50,000 that was given away to charity as a result. $50,000, I mean, it was just unbelievable. The congregation was so excited that they got to be part of the story. They got to play along. Could you imagine if you could like take the weekend services and make it an all skate for, for everything where people can actually contribute and be part of it? Um, some of the people, what they did is they held bazaars. Others made crafts. Others had garage sales or they offered financial counseling or other types of services. You know, my favorite part of the story, um, they wrote, a newspaper in town had written an article about this church, and my favorite part of the story was this little old lady who felt a little intimidated about the whole concept at first. She's like, well, the only thing I can do at my age is make a pie. And so <laughs> it's like this little 80-year-old woman. Well, she made a lot of pies, and they must have been really good pies because single-handedly she raised over $500 herself just making 
pies. Now, granted, this church could have taken maybe a little bit more of the typical route and just run a three-week series on, you know, stewardship or giving, but this seems to have made a much bigger impact. Don't you guys agree? I mean, people were engaged. They got to be in the game. They got to be part of the story and feeling like they were contributing as well. And I'm sure that it's something that they're not going to soon forget. And for many people, this is the best part, this was their very first encounter with the church. For the folks that actually bought the goods or received the services, this was the first time that they had gotten to really be connected with the church. Now, Google taught us that we don't necessarily control the path to entry anymore. The front door may not necessarily be the front door. You can type in a keyword and it might bring you in through a whole host of side doors within a company's organization, right? That's the beauty of Google. You don't have to go through a series of all of these pathways to get the information that you're looking for. Well, the same is actually true for your church. The weekend service might not be the first time that they get connected with your church. Maybe the first time is that they're invited to a small group. Or maybe they have their child enrolled in your preschool program or your MOPS program or the vacation Bible school. Or maybe it's a family who needs help and so they're at the food pantry. Or perhaps it's someone who came to a baptism service to watch their adult daughter get baptized. These are all touch points that lead into your church. And this is a way that people are getting engaged. So again, instead of asking how can we get them to our weekend service, outreach event, or homepage, maybe instead we should be asking questions like, how can we change the perceptions of those who don't know us yet? Or how can we make our big church feel a little bit smaller so it's easier for people to get connected? Or how do we simplify the life of the single mom who is overworked, overwhelmed, and overloaded with information in general? I mean, does sending multiple postcard promotions from the women's ministry, the children's ministry, the missions ministry, all church, you know, is that helping or hurting in this relationship? What about someone who's new and they're wanting to learn more? Is the information booth and a fistful of brochures their only option? Or could they maybe text in a number from a side screen that they see in the lobby or even from their seat, making it easier for them to get information and get connected? Park Community Church in Chicago actually did just that. You guys may have read about them in Church Marketing Sucks when they killed their weekly bulletin. They actually, when they killed that bulletin, it, it resulted, incidentally, in saving over $35,000 that was freed up for other things like creating an online magazine, texting, among other things. Now, I want you guys to just pause with me for a moment. This is going to be a happy moment. And we're going to imagine a land with no bulletins. <sighs> I mean, wouldn't that be an amazing thing? Okay. Back to reality. Sorry. A little divert there. Tim Schrader is the communications director and creative genius over at Park, and he explained the vision behind the online magazine or the e-zine was to have a collective place that shares stories and celebrates what's going on in the church and the impact that they're having in the city. Um, he had said, you know, this isn't going to just be like a regular newsletter where it's a collection of upcoming events, but something that truly engages the church with the life of the city. And they're going to print some of these things, like a limited edition, and have those available for people to purchase in the bookstore as more of kind of a, a conversational piece. This isn't something that, you know, people are going to toss, but that they would want to keep. They also recently began a series called Urban Jesus, where it explores some of the fundamental issues around Christianity. Now, a lot of the people who come to Park Church don't typically go to church. And so they wanted to make this as easy as possible for them to ask questions and to feel comfortable in the environment. Kind of, they said they wanted to remove the barriers or reduce the barriers between the platform and the seats, is what they were really looking to do. 
And so what they did um, to kick off this series is they allowed people to text in questions to their lead pastor while he was speaking. Kind of like how you guys are texting in ideas like now, and not questions, ideas about how that would work. And then uh, Jackson, their lead pastor, he answered those questions from the platform at the end of the service. And so um, they actually they tried this at their 5.30 service on Sunday, and it was wildly successful. People were excited because they kind of it gave them an anonymous way that they could feel free to ask questions that perhaps they might not otherwise feel comfortable asking, and have those answered in a in a more direct way. You know, without having to go to the welcome center or the visitors information booth or the get connected. You know class that was afterwards, it was instantaneous and it made it easy for people to get engaged, get involved right away. Leadership got emails afterwards from some of their longer term members who actually said, we are so excited and proud of our church for stepping out and trying some of this, leveraging technology in a different way, you know, kind of redeeming it for a higher purpose, you could say. Other churches, like Scott Hodges Church in Aurora, the Orchard, which is an amazing church. I'm looking forward to you guys hearing him speak tomorrow morning. And I can honestly say it's amazing because I go to that church, so I'm a little bit biased there. But they had kicked off a series on spiritual disciplines. And Scott really wanted the congregation to understand how um, having prayer rhythms, you guys, are you you familiar with the whole set prayer rhythms where you can pause for certain times throughout the day and just reflect on a specific scripture and get in the habit of that as, as a spiritual discipline? And so to help remind people how this could potentially work, they had the congregation sign up for Twitter accounts. And then at like 8, noon, and 5 or something like that, they would push these Twitter messages to their congregation of a scripture that they could use to to pray on, and it helped them, they did this for about a week, and it helped everybody to kind of get into the idea of what set prayer times were all about. Again, they were engaging people, you know, and using technology in different ways. And it's not all about technology. While technology is important, you know, that's not the end-all, be-all. I mean, you know, if your senior pastor thinks that having a pager and, you know, the uh, a modem is the tools for the information superhighway. You're, you're, we, we understand you're in the right place, but it's not really just all about technology. Okay, so now we had talked a little bit about examples from the marketplace. We talked a little bit about some examples of what other churches are doing. Now I want to see what you guys think. Let's see, kind of, maybe we could push up to the screen some of the ideas that folks had have. Okay, cool. So we got gas card giveaways. Oh gosh, that's an excellent idea. When you think about how much gas prices, I'm not sure about here, but in Chicago it's almost five bucks a gallon, which is insane. My son actually has a, um, a pizza delivery job where he's driving this beater SUV. He's basically working for free because all of his money is going to gas. But gas card giveaways, that's an excellent idea. Uh, pastor has a laptop and congregation can ask questions during the message. Fantastic. Having students create videos to be uploaded on YouTube and promoting the summer camp. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Tossing large beach balls from the balcony during our awkward connecting time. <laughs> That's an excellent idea. If you get hit with a beach ball, it kind of just breaks the ice no matter where you are, right? That's a great idea. Empower your congregation by giving them money to bless someone else. Okay, so it's kind of like a spin on the parable of talents where the church gave it to individuals, but give the congregation more of a pay it forward kind of a concept. That makes sense. A website that allows attendees to submit short stories about God healing parts of their life. You know, that makes so much sense. Um, With a lot of the work that I do personally with churches all over the place, that's one of the number one things that comes up over and over and over again in the focus groups that we run, is that people, especially people who don't usually go to church, they want to know that this church isn't some weird, freaky, cult sort of place with Bible-banging, strange people that just don't understand things. So sharing stories of how people's lives are being changed really is powerful. It helps folks to relate and connect in new ways, and so that's, that's a great idea, okay? Hold a think tank once a month where people can share ideas for upcoming messages, or that could be online, okay? Include a spot online where people can share their stories. We got that one again, multiple. And love the idea of texting questions in for the pastor. 
Fantastic. Well, those are some really good ideas. You guys, I'm impressed. Um, all right, now I want this session today to be as helpful as possible. So I've got three application points that you guys can take home. Um, number one, I want you to think about your church specifically. What changes, however small they may be, can be made to help start shifting the relationship that you have between your audience today and kind of where the, uh, the relationship you'd like to have with them moving forward. Number two, write them down. Try to be as specific as possible. You know, talk with your team, develop a plan, but think specifically about your audiences. Like, you know, the new person who's coming. How can we help to change perceptions or give them the information that they would be looking for? Or the family that's stressed out and that's just driving their child from activity to activity to activity to activity. You know, how can we change the relationship that we have with them? And then take action. Even if it's just one thing that you guys are able to do, you know, it's still one step closer than, you know, where you are today. And so it takes, it's one thing to write about it, it's another to think about it, but to actually take action is going to really help to start moving things forward. Well, you guys have been really fantastic. Thank you so much for kind of working through and, and doing the exercise. I was hoping that maybe we could take a moment just to close in prayer. Does that sound good for you? Okay. Dear Father, you know that each person here is not here by accident. You know that our jobs are really hard. And you know that everybody here is in different places right now. And Father, I pray that you just encourage folks that are here. I pray that this session and the other sessions from today and tomorrow will help to spark new ideas and encourage And I pray, I pray that <laughs> apparently when I am done praying that my mic just goes off. <laughs> but Lord, I just thank you so much for, for being here with us today. And I pray that you bless each person that's here and their families moving forward. Thank you so much. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.